So let us now consider isometric strength testing, and we're going to do this in the context of validity and reliability, and, and, and evaluate some of the different approaches that are available to us in this regard. So let's start with those basic principles of isometric testing. And you can see on the screen here, this is, this is a, an, an isometric back dynamometer, quite a, a, a popular tool that is, that is used. And um, using these back dynamometers is quite neat. We have the platform that the participant stands on here. It's a strain gauge within this device and they stand on the platform with their legs locked straight <coughs> and they're out and they're on straight but they're kind of bent over and then what you try and do is you try and stand up but without um, without driving through the legs it should all be coming from the from the back itself but what do we know about isometric testing well we know this generally performed to quantify the maximum force or torque and or the maximum rate of force or torque development. So depending upon the kind of the approach that we take, we can either, we can either have a rotational, theoretically rotational value, we'll, we'll deal with why it's probably not rotational, and also we can have um, the rate at which the force is being produced. So in other words, the rapidity, the how quickness. The rate of force development, as we've got here, is calculated from the force time curve. So if we, if we are tracking in real time the force being produced, what we can do is we can evaluate how quickly it takes to reach a force in, say, 5 milliseconds or 60 milliseconds, or the time taken to reach a specified value. So let's say 500 newtons or 30% of the maximum voltage contraction, or how long does it take to reach the peak force within that muscle action. So it's going beyond just the notion of it's a value for force on its, on its own. So what we know under isometric conditions, we get the maximum force produced, which is called the maximum voluntary contraction. And again, this was something that is covered in the previous um, lecture series, which is on muscle physiology and force generation, is that the maximum force that can be produced is isometrically. The reason being, under isometric conditions, we get near as damn it 100% neural recruitment. So almost near as damn it all the motor units in the engaged muscle are recruited. We never get that under eccentric and concentric con conditions. And so the net result is that under the isometric condition, you should produce the highest force that is possible does vary a little bit depending upon the length tension relationship of the muscle but if we look at the force being produced at the same angle under isometric conditions to say the same angle where we're moving through that range of motion concentrically or eccentrically significantly more force is produced isometrically because there is greater neural recruitment so here i've got this graph which is taken from the work of murphy and what we can see here is we've got that time in milliseconds on our x-axis. And then they've got the torque in this example here is newton meters on the uh, y-axis. I have to say I would dispute this as being newton meters. And the reason I would dispute this is if you are doing something which is isometric, there cannot be any rotational force. The limb is no longer rotating. It is stationary. So actually, as much as they've got Newton meters, I would get rid of the M. It's actually Newtons rather than Newton meters. But what this shows you is it shows us this kind of um, bi-exponential curve. You see we've got a single response here, and then you've got the second exponential response here. And so what they've got is they've broken it down. This is the maximum force that's been produced. And we can see now that the unit of time is just under 1,000 milliseconds. And then they've got this, which they call the initiation point. And so this is kind of the initial period of time in terms of where, where the propagation of force starts to be developed. It might be that if we've got to 160 newtons, we might say, well, actually, how long does it take to reach 80 newton meters, 50% of the MVC? And actually, it's taking in the region of around about 200 to 250 milliseconds. So we can get much, much more from this data than just simply a single value to reflect the amount of force that's being produced. So why bother? Because if you think about it logically, 
it doesn't seem very um, realistic to do isometric testing. If you think about most sporting actions, in most sporting actions, we don't really seem to work isometrically. There may be examples in sport where we do, maybe in a rugby scrum, you may well work isometrically. There may be some positions in gymnastics where we're holding the position isometrically. But actually, in most instances, the isometric strength is, is, is not very important to, to sport. But you can perhaps see why it has a greater place, for example, in, in health and clinical settings, where particularly in clinical population groups, there is a greater propensity for being stationary and therefore not having change in muscle length because of, of perhaps trying to get balance or just not being able to move. So there may be a better justification there, but it goes beyond that. One of the key reasons that people use these is they are easily standardised and are therefore considered to be reproducible. And what we see in the literature, and we're going we're gonna to question this in a moment, is high levels of reliability have been reported. So they've looked at kind of test retest and suggested that they're highly reliable tests when, when working isometrically. The other thing that's quite important is they are simple tests. Now that is important, not for you as the researcher, but actually it's very important for the participant. They don't require lots of technique. When we get into things like um, iso-inertial iso testing, things like squats or bench pressing as an example, there's a huge amount of technique required to, to make those, those as efficient and proficient as possible. And so the beauty with these isometric tests is where there's not a lot of technique needed, you can do these pretty much, and they're valid in pretty much trained, untrained, clinical, non-clinical population groups. They're very much straightforward to administer based upon one, there's not a lot of technique, but two, there's actually very little explanation needed apart from push as hard as you can or grip as hard as you can. It's basically, you're just being asked to, to exert a maximal force. There is no requirement to move through a range of motion. There's no complexities in the action that's going to be performed. So there's clearly quite just good justification for why we would probably assess these. Um, the question then comes, well, how reliable are they? Well, I put that statement a moment ago, which was suggesting, well, actually, you know, the, the, the literature would suggest that they're highly reliable. Well, in science, we always have to question. We always have to ask why or how. And so the question here is, well, why? Why do they tell us that? Why do they inform us that? And how have they demonstrated that? Well, the first thing is this, which is a limitation more than a reliability thing, which is, well, there are clear mechanical differences between isometric and dynamic contractions. And it comes back to the point that was made within the previous section of this, this presentation, which is most sporting actions are not isometric. So if they're not isometric, why assess isometric force? If it's not relevant to the sporting action, is it worthwhile assessing? We have to think very carefully when we're assessing athletes. We have to think about the kind of the uh, efficacy of this. There's no point collecting data for the sake of collecting data. We have to have a solid rationale for why we want to do it. Otherwise, you end up wasting A, some time, but B, actually ethically, it is not particularly ethical to collect data for the sake of collecting data unless you've got a solid justification. So there are, you know, this does pose an, an issue. You can see that the justification is probably stronger for clinical population groups, but when we're comparing it kind of to dynamic actions, an isometric test may not be the most suitable approach. Because there are differences in the mechanical actions, we know that motor unit recruitment patterns are also shown to be different within the isometric tests when you compare them to dynamic actions. It makes a lot of sense. You know, if you're going through a range of motion and you think about the length tension relationship, again, under those, under those kind of conditions, what you see, if you remember, is that the amount of force being produced varies depending upon the interaction between the actin and the myosin filaments. And that is fundamentally dependent upon the amount of motor units that can be recruited. So go back, if you're unsure about how this works, go back to the, the lecture series on the physiology of, of muscle contractions of force generation and go and refresh yourself up on the kind of notion of rate coding and Henman's size principle. Because fundamentally, 
what happens is as that kind of active force changes, the number of motor units will, will change and the size of the motor unit will change. Whereas under a static isometric condition, that isn't an issue. We've cr we we recruit all the motor units because it's a maximum. If it's maximal and we're going for an MVC, we recruit all the motor units in that single action. So very very different propositions between the two types of muscle action. And then it alludes to what we were referring to a moment ago, is that there are clearly going to be differences in motor unit firing patterns for the same joint angle. So if you, if I want you to, to, to have a look at your, for example, your own leg at the moment and, and stare at your leg. And if you imagine you've got the, the knee joint is at 90 degrees. And I ask you then to, to push as hard as you can through the flexors and extensors of, of the knee at 90 degrees. So we're going to do it isometrically. So we know that that produces an MVC, a maximal voluntary contraction, and, and a, a maximal voluntary contraction is absolutely connected to motor unit recruitment. It's, it's near a diet for motor unit recruitment. If, on the other hand, I now ask you to do knee flexion to knee extension, so just simply moving and moving a load, a resistance, the heaviest resistance you can through that range of motion, because the length tension of the muscle changes, so does the firing patterns. Because we, the firing pattern that we, we, we initiate, the number of motor units we recruit, is dependent upon the, um, the length of the muscle. And the length of the muscle changes when we're going through dynamic movements. Whereas when it's isometric, irrespective of the joint angle, we're going to get maximal neural recruitment for that same, for that respective joint angle. And then the final thing that differentiates them, I suppose, which affects their, you know, the limitation, not only reliability, but affects their limitation, um, or, or creates a limitation, is isometrics don't benefit from elastic energy. When you've got dynamic actions, there's a huge elastic energy. There's a huge kind of... Um, contribution to the muscle action from elastic recoil, which we don't get the notion of moving from an eccentric to a concentric, the notion of moving from potential to kinetic energy, which you don't have under isometric actions. So let's just have a look at some data here. So what we've got here is we've got some data, it's presented as the means, we've got standard errors, uh, as well, an isometric force across a range of knee angles in field jumpers. So those are in our black columns and volleyball players. They're our grey columns. So we, what we've got is after 200 milliseconds of an isometric contraction, that's in our left panel. And we've got our peak isometric force in the right panel. And what we've got is we've got the component loadings and we've got here the kind of the, 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 the force. But what you can see is they've, they've got here the knee angle, so we've got length, and then we've got force, which is tension. And can you see that in accordance with the length-tension relationship for both of our jumpers and our volleyball players, at a, a kind of a, a restricted knee angle, say 10 degree knee angle, the amount of force being produced is significantly lower than the amount of force being produced at around about 60 to 70 degrees uh, knee angle. And then it starts to dissipate as we get to, say, 90 degrees. So what we can see is kind of the, the differences across that range of motion in terms of at 200 milliseconds. We can also see those differences in this panel here across the range of motion in terms of the peak force that's being produced. And perhaps, you know, not surprisingly, um, the field jumpers are actually producing higher forces at almost all angular angles, knee angles, than our jumpers are. But it does show us that the, the amount of force that we produce, even though they're all MVCs, does change. Because it's, although I, I'm going to recruit all the motor units, actually, the ability for the actin and myosin to interact here and here is significantly different to here. Here I've got optimal interaction between the actin and myosin filaments. Here I've got overlap. Here I've got too much potential elongation. 
So in other words, it changes the amount of force we produce. In this example here, what we've got is we've got our four bar graphs, and what we've, we've got is um, rate of force development, and we've got the, the, the force that's being produced. And what we've got is we've got two different um, categorizations on our, on our graph. So what we have is data for the force that's being produced, which is, is um, our FOR data. And then we've got data which is for the rate of force development, which is the RFD data. And what we have them is at different joint angles. We have them at a 90 degree joint angle and a 120 degree joint angle. And what you can see is more absolute force is being produced in this example at a joint angle of 120 degrees joint angle compared to 90 degrees. And again, it's a reflection of the interaction between the actin and the myosin filament. But interestingly, what we also see in association with that, the rapidity with which we generate force is also affected and it changes depending upon the joint angle because the rapidity with which I generate force is a function of not only how quickly you recruit the muscle, but how much of the active muscle mass can be recruited to generate that force. And if we then look at this data here, this is a correlational matrix, and this is to show us the correlation between um, an isometric maximum force and a medicine ball throw. Now, the medicine ball throw here is our dynamic measure of strength, the distance somebody throws a medicine ball. One can argue that it's not a very, you know, very valid test. It's, you know, if you think about what it's assessing, it's just simply measuring distance. But what we see here is that the force being produced at an isometric joint angle of 120 degrees is highly correlated to the amount of force being produced at 90 degrees. Well, that probably makes sense. They are also, though, correlated to medicine ball distance throw. And this is why people start to get into the idea of doing isometric testing, because because it, it, it requires less technique and it requires less practice and potentially less expensive equipment. It seems to indicate to us that it's a proxy indicator of maximal strength. In other words, the argument being made is this is a dynamic strength movement. And actually, the people that did better in these dynamic strength movements were also the people that did better in the isometric test. We know that that's the case because the values are positive. So in other words, both values must be increasing to generate that correlation. But what you'll notice is that there is no correlation, no association between medicine ball throw distance and the rate of force development at either 90 degrees or 120 degrees. And that's quite important to understand because a medicine ball throw is just an indication of strength. It is not a measure of power. So it's not how fast I do that movement, whereas these are about the rapidity with which the action occurred. So one can understand why medicine ball throws perhaps not correlated to the rate of force development isometrically.